Welcome to the American Maritime Podcast. I'm your host, Mike Roberts. This podcast is meant to have a robust conversation about the issues that matter to the 650,000 men and women who make American Maritime work. We're doing this because their work matters to this country. It makes a difference to our national and homeland security. And these are highly skilled men and women whose jobs contribute to a stronger, more diversified and resilient economy. I greatly appreciate the support of the American Maritime Partnership for making this podcast possible. With us today are, are Brian Clark and Tim Walton, uh, two experts from the Center for the Strategic and Budgetary Assessment. Uh, CSB is a top tier national security think tank in Washington. They've just released a report on the impact of our maritime industry on national and homeland security. Here is the report right here. You can find it at csbaonline.org. It's a very important and comprehensive study, and I would encourage you to read it. Brian is a senior fellow at uh, CSBA. Before that, he was special assistant to the chief of naval operations and had high-level responsibilities for strategy, technical, and organizational matters. Tim is a research uh, uh, fellow at CSBA and a prolific writer on a variety of national security topics ranging from uh, U.S. force planning to Chinese information uh, warfare. Welcome. It's great to have you both here with us uh, today. Uh, we're going to just jump right into it, um, uh, uh, but I do have one more preliminary uh, point to make. Uh, this is a comprehensive report, and, and I want the viewers to, to understand that it covers both domestic and international maritime uh, commerce and, and, and industry. Uh, AMP, American Maritime Partnership, is interested in the domestic industry, so that's what we're going to talk mostly about today. Um, but uh, 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 So the first topic I want to cover is, it concerns sea lift, uh, which is the sort of activating ships to carry supplies uh, overseas in the event of a military contingency or national security event. Uh, this was critical uh, in World War II. Everybody remembers the, the merchant mariners and the contribution that they made to the success early, particularly early in the war. But um, some may question uh, the continued relevance of sea lift in an era of cyber security and uh, space force and, and right. so on, those sorts of uh, uh, capabilities and and you know it's a fair question. I mean, your job in a, in in the world that you work in is to ask the tough questions and and then you know come up with an honest answer to that. So, uh, please talk a little bit, if you will, about the continued need for sea lift in the twenty first century. Uh, sure, thanks, Mike. I appreciate the opportunity to come on the podcast uh, and the inaugural podcast for that. Uh, Tim and I are honored to be here. The uh, the sea lift requirements of the future are likely to be different than those of the past. Uh, you know, we saw World War II was a certain model where we had the Battle of the Atlantic and we were flowing enormous quantities of material over to support a war uh, in a theater across the ocean from the United States. Uh, during the Cold War, we anticipated a similar flow of forces. Uh, during uh, the recent wars in Iraq and Afghanistan, we saw a much different uh, flow of, of material and forces over to the Middle East and then within the Middle East. Um, I think for future conflicts, it'll continue to change. It's likely to be you know, less maybe than what we saw in the previous contingencies, but it's likely to also be different in character, meaning it could be much more protracted. Uh, so we would need for, you know, flow of uh, sea lift for a longer period of time than we did in the mobilization for uh, Iraqi freedom or Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, and then also, I think we're going to need to use uh, a lot more uh, uh, tanking and uh non-traditional cargo capacity, you know, that we've had in previous conflicts because the, the nature of the material that we need to take over to a foreign contingency is probably going to be different. So in our study, one thing we looked at was how do we make sea lift more flexible in, in the future? How do we create a model so that we're able to mobilize a sea lift force that's able to deliver the fuel, material, people, and, and uh, equipment that we need um, whether the contingency is small or, or large, uh, and whether it's protracted or short. So 
the model we look at here is is shifting a lot more of our sea lift from a government owned force to be a uh, a combination of government owned and commercial forces that are chartered or leased on a, on a long term basis by the government, uh, which we think is a lot more flexible way to manage sea lift than the, the former model where we try to build it all up in advance and sustain it for some period of time in, in the hopes of being able to use it in a contingency. So the model you're talking about relies more on industry participation than, than in the past. Right. Yes, uh, absolutely. Because um, one challenge the government has right now is that sea lift capacity that's government owned is aging out and uh, needs to be recapitalized. And a lot of these ships are still seam powered. Uh, they're 40 right. plus years old. You have difficulty not only uh, maintaining them, the older ships, but you also have difficulty manning them because getting the mariners who know how to operate a steam propulsion plant uh, is difficult today. Uh, one of the ways you can get around that is by turning to industry and saying, well, we're going to lease ships from you that we'll have in some kind of ready, ready, you know, ready reserve kind of status that we can then mobilize uh, when the time comes to do so. And then industry can be responsible for changing those ships out, ensuring that they're manned with the appropriate number of mariners, making sure the mariners are trained and certified to support that kind of ship. Uh, we thought that model was going to be a lot better than a more, more flexible, uh, more ready. Mm -hmm. uh, and also, it's a better partnership with industry than the current model. Sure, mm -hmm. sure. So it, it enhances readiness. Um, it certainly it does. And I think that alternate model also provides new opportunities in terms of creating a force that's uh, more resilient also. I think one of the, the changes in terms of future requirements for sea lift is that it might be a contested maritime environment, right. where many of the, the studies that inform the size and character of the, the previous sea lift fleet, known as the Mobility Capabilities Requirements Studies, the, de the Department of Defense takes place. In many cases, they used to assume a relatively uncontested operating environment, where attrition would be light. In a future force, that attrition might be more significant. And so we need to, to think about what are best ways to create a force that's uh, probably larger, but also differently shaped in terms of the composition of its ships, uh, introduces also new attributes to make ships a little more resilient and those crews more trained. And the flexible model that Brian was talking about is probably an easier, faster way to transition to that necessary future fleet than simply trying to recapitalize the, the current fleet today. That's interesting. Uh, the domestic maritime industry sort of by definition operates in our home waters mm -hmm. uh, and not into international uh, trades where the contingencies are, are going to likely to happen and, and where we need to provide the sea lift capabilities. Uh, yet you find that uh, the domestic maritime industry does provide an important contribution to our sea lift capabilities in mariners and tank vessels and so on. You want to talk a little bit about that? Uh, yeah, so when we did the study, one of the things we, we looked at at the start was to skeptically assess our current framework of laws, regulations, and programs uh, within the U.S. government that supports uh, the national security contributions of the maritime industry, which sea lift is a, is a main one. There's some other ones that we talked about in the report as well. Uh, but looking at uh, sea lift primarily, the domestic fleet uh, in our analysis turned out to be extremely important for providing mariners to man up uh, ships that are inactive most of the time. So today the government has 60 some ships that are in an inactive status that need to be crewed with mariners to support you know, the mobilization of sea lift. Um, those mariners have to come from somewhere. Um, a lot of them come from uh, the domestic fleet. Mariners that are not currently um, out at sea are available to be turned around and used on these inactive ships. Uh, also, that domestic maritime industry is really important to provide a shipbuilding demand signal so that uh, we have a sm set of shipbuilders that are used to building smaller ships that the government needs episodically. So there's mm -hmm. a set of ships that the government buys for the Coast Guard, for the Navy, uh, for NOAA and other research organizations that are not the the larger, more complex warships that the Navy buys. Those ships don't get bought often enough to create a maritime industry on their own, so they depend on there being a U.S. maritime shipbuilding and ship repair industry for them to tap into when they need it. Mm -hmm. uh, so the, the domestic fleet provides that demand signal that supports that industry in between times when the government needs ships. So we saw those as two main, main contributions from an industrial standpoint, uh, and there's some homeland security contributions that that domestic fleet provides as well we could talk about later. Sure. But but we thought that the domestic fleet absolutely was essential to provide a pool of mariners. Uh, because one thing we found in the study is that market forces in a capitalist society do prevail. Yeah. <laughs> and so the number of mariners in our current mm -hmm. merchant marine today is bright sized for the number of ships that are under U.S. flag. Right. You know, so there's a few extra because people you know are not 
currently active in the fleet, but not very many. Um, so if you didn't have this domestic fleet, there would be no pool of, of mariners that are rotated off their ships that would be available. Um, and the only way to create that is to make a larger U.S. flagged fleet. Mm -hmm. and, the, and, the, and the portion of the pool of mariners that would be needed in a sea lift contingency is... Uh, that that is, from the domestic side of things is is substantial. Uh, if I, it's like twenty nine percent, something like that. It's right, exactly. That was our estimate using some of Marad's um, Marad Working Group uh, data, and it's a pretty significant amount in terms of supporting that surge sea lift contributions. There's also a small portion of the domestic fleet, and in particular in terms of container ships, that could have a role during an activation to provide strategic sea lift. But uh, one of the findings of our study is that is it, it's essential for there to be, I think, a good integration between the domestic fleet and the international fleet, mm -hmm. where we want there to be healthy domestic fleet for, for certain purposes, in particular the ones that Brian mentioned, but we also need a healthy international fleet uh, because we don't want during a conflict to have to rob the domestic fleet to be able to man or operate the strategic sea lift one. And let me, let me kind of bring up the issue of tankers in, in that regard. Uh, there's a fascinating... Uh, figure in here around the tanker capacity requirement and the shortfall that we have there. If there's sort of one thing that jumps out at you in this report, it's that, it's that uh, uh, figure. Uh, it's, it's a major shortfall. And you look at, uh, you know, best case scenario, every tanker uh, uh, that, that's under the U.S. flag is, is, is brought to bear. And, and you're still 20 out of 86 tankers short. And most of those tankers come from the domestic fleet. Exactly. Do right. you, know, you want to talk about that a little? Yeah. yeah, so Tim brought this great point about the integration between the domestic and international fleets, where um, we depend on the international fleet for the ships uh, in large part, and we depend on the, the domestic fleet for a lot of the mariners. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, for the tanking capacity, uh, we only have a very small number of U.S. flag tankers you know, that, that are currently operating, except for those in the domestic fleet. So internationally, there's not that many. And um, domestically, there's a larger number not all of them are militarily useful. They're not all big enough. They don't have all the right equipment to be able to carry fuel and you know other other uh, tanking materials overseas. So mm -hmm. um, we to be able to create the tanky capacity necessary for what we believe is necessary for a large scale contingency, we're going to have to get foreign tankers. You know, we'd have to charter, and that's what's happened in the past: is the U.S. government's had to charter foreign tankers to make up for that gap because not all the domestic tankers are available for use, because as Tim mentioned, they've right. got other jobs to do. And then um, also not all of them are, are militarily useful, and then you're still short. Um, so foreign tankers end up filling the gap, which is probably not a position the U.S. government wants to be in, in a, in a contingency, right. especially with a country like China that owns the world's largest shipping fleet. Right, right. Let's shift, uh, if, we, if we might, to uh, uh, shipbuilding. Uh, America's shipbuilding uh, capacity consists mostly of commercial companies uh, that handle government or, or commercial orders and provide those uh, ships and, and ship repair work in, in the government and commercial sector. Uh, as long as I've been doing this, uh, when you talk about the defense industrial base, uh, the first thing that comes to mind is our shipbuilding capacity. Uh, why is that? <laughs> well, <laughs> uh, so for one reason, it's because it's uh, a unique capability of the United States to be able to build some of these warships. Um, and uh, that tends to be what we come to first. Also, our shipbuilders are entirely commercial companies. There is no U.S. government ship armament you know, foundry like we had in, a, in World War II. We actually had some government-owned foundries and shipyards that would build ships, and that's not the case today. All of our government shipyards are ship repair yards, and they're strictly limited to nuclear-powered ships. So all of our conventional ships have to be maintained by commercial ship repair yards, and all of our ships entirely are built by commercial shipbuilding uh, organizations. Uh, so you depend on that industry for the, the Navy, um, but even more so, like we had said uh, earlier, you depend on those commercial shipbuilders to be able to build the non-military ships that form uh, the Coast Guard fleet, the NOAA fleet, um, some of the law enforcement fleets. Th those ships are not built by the military shipyards that, that specialize in large complex warships, and they, they need a business that keeps them in, uh, uh, in operation between the times the government is coming for a smaller set of ships to be constructed. So it's absolutely essential that you have that commercial maritime industry to support the parts of the, of the government fleet that are not the Navy's largest, most prestigious warships. It would, would it be fair to, to say we need a critical mass of, of shipbuilding capability, expertise, and facilities mm -hmm. so that we have something to scale up when we need it? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 
to scale up when we need it. And I think part of the approach of generating that critical mass, not just during a high-end conflict, which is a worst-case scenario, right. but also just during peacetime or what the Department of Defense calls the competition phase, is promoting what we termed as a national fleet approach to sort of the maritime industry in general and then to shipbuilding in, in particular, where we could better align and coordinate maybe some of our commercial shipbuilding with some of the government uh, shipbuilding, both for civilian and, and military customers, so we can have a sort of steady state workflow across the industry and a steady demand signal that this is a priority for the U.S. government, for U.S. commercial carriers, and it encourages shipyards to then make the necessary investments. And then the way I think you accelerate that investment is looking at improved Title 11 financing or some strategic investments to modernize some aspects of shipyards to help them make them most competitive as possible. Because we want to have a healthy maritime industrial base, but we also know that in order to make it cost effective, it needs to be efficient and right. cost competitive on, sort of on an international scale. So th there are investments necessary to make that shipbuilding base better for the future. So your report has recommendations, and, and you've just gone through a couple of them related to shipbuilding. Um, if if uh, we took those recommendations and took them up to Congress and Congress said, yeah, those are great ideas, we're going to enact them tomorrow and, and in, in whole, exactly what you guys have recommended, uh, would that make American shipbuilding competitive with, with China or South Korea? No. Uh, so what we looked at uh, in terms of the national security contributions of the maritime industrial base was, uh, how can we make it so that the shipbuilding industry is able to support our national security needs? Uh, so how do you make it able to support these government ship programs that are not continuous like the Navy's shipbuilding programs? How do you make it so that our government ship repair yards are better able to support the government fleet, um, but not necessarily how do we make a shipbuilder like a Philly shipyard able to work at the level of Daewoo in Korea? Mm -hmm. I, I think that's that wasn't what we were trying to accomplish. Right, right. Um, you know, in part that's because that that Daewoo and, and the shipyards in China have already captured a lot of that business. Uh, it's unlikely that the U.S. would be able to go in and, and supplant them as a, as a lead shipbuilder. Uh, and also, until you uh, change some of the other, the other parts of the business model, uh, constructing a ship in the United States is still not going to be as cheap as it is in a country like China or even Korea, where they're subsidizing the shipyard and covering some of the overhead and allowing them to sell ships at a much lower price than what you're able to achieve in the United States. Uh, do we uh, lose anything from a national security perspective in not having a commercial shipbuilding uh, industry that's as, as strong as, as what China is doing in terms of subsidies and those sorts of things? Mm -hmm. uh, I'd add, I think that there is a cost. I, I think China, you can review a number of studies where both the Chinese uh, shipbuilding industry, the Korean ones, have increasingly leveraged the crossover between commercial yards and military yards, and, and that's allowed them to reduce costs. So even though there are some different military unique standards for some of their military warships, the ability to have a, a large yard with a trained workforce, uh, some good skills throughout that yard, allows them to, to reduce the cost. So I think there, there is a cost, but, but as Brian mentioned, it's probably a challenge to, to try to envision U.S. commercial shipyards being able to produce ships at the scale uh, and right. quantity as the Chinese right. commercial ones. Uh, we, I think we can make U.S. shipyards more efficient, and there are investments that we can make to modernize those shipyards and make them more efficient. But I think part of the reason that the costs are so low in Chinese and Korean shipyards are because they have these enormous subsidies that cover some of their costs, but because of the subsidies and then some contracts to, to buy ships, they're buying ships at, at scores, right? And they'll have right. ships in a class, and they're going to buy 10, 20, 30, 40 ships of a single class, which allows them to work their way down the learning curve right. and lower that cost. So unless there were a sort of a national, more economic decision to pursue that, right. uh, that's something we won't see in the U.S. It is critical, though, for us to improve the competitiveness of U.S. yards. I, we thought it was really important to look at it through this national security lens because it gives you a way of saying – how good do we need to make the shipbuilding industry in the United States? Because either the bar is, I want to compete with China and, and Korea and Japan, right. or the bar is, I want to be able to produce the ships I need to be able to produce for my national security purposes. That bar is lower, and it's easier to define what that looks like. Mm -hmm. um, so when you look at like proposals, like let's require U.S. tankers that are carrying U.S. government fuel to be U.S. built, you know, that could be a requirement that, that Congress puts in place. 
Uh, so you could see that those, those tankers will not be as cheap as those that you would buy from China or, or Korea. But those tankers would allow you to build up a domestic industry that would allow you to supply tankers to government purposes. Uh, it would allow you to continue keeping these shipyards in business that you would depend on for government ships episodically. You know, right. like I, I need a ship from that shipyard every five years, but you know, in between times, you need to create a business for them to do. So that that's one way to do that. That national security lens gives you a way of defining what's good enough in terms of supporting the shipbuilding industry. Great, great answer. Um, we've we've talked about shipbuilding, U.S. flagships, mariners. Um, the report defines a new concept: the national, uh, the defense maritime industrial base, um, and I think that's a great term. Um, uh, can you talk a little bit about what you mean by that? So we wanted to uh, get beyond the discussion of the defense industrial base. People kind of know what that is. That's the, the collection of companies and laboratories and organizations that support uh, the development of defense capabilities. You know, so your, your traditional defense contractors and the research organizations and all that. Uh, in the maritime side, there's a whole different set of organizations that it, it kind of expands beyond just your traditional government vendors to include uh, a lot of shipping companies that only periodically or episodically are actually providing services to the government. Um, the shipbuilders that then build ships for them, the ship repair yards that deal with government and commercial ships. So in the maritime industry, you've got this interesting intersection of government uh, government-focused vendors, and then vendors that only deal with the government periodically, which is not necessarily the case in other parts of the defense industry, which has largely kind of hived itself off from commercial industry in the United States. If you look outside of the maritime, you pretty much build airplanes for the government or you don't, um, or you, you repair uh, materials or you build uh, radar systems for the government or, or you don't. You know, Northrop Grumman's not building a lot of radars for the FAA. Some, somebody else is doing that. Uh, but the maritime industry is where you've got this interesting intersection. So we wanted to talk about this defense maritime industrial base to make sure people understood you've got this growing ecosystem of companies and organizations that influence the ability of the United States to uh, have a to contribute to the ability of the United States to use the maritime for its national security purposes. Um, that is growing even further as the maritime industry starts to take on new technologies. You know, so the introduction of autonomous systems, uh, unmanned ships. Um, requires new communication, new satellite navigation capabilities. So the maritime industry continues to expand in terms of the number of players in it as new technologies are brought in, and that expands what this defense maritime industrial base consists of. Great. Um, let me shift a little bit now to China. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of attention has been paid to what China has been doing uh, with respect to both its Navy and its commercial shipbuilding. You touch, touched on this earlier. Uh, from uh, what should we make of that from an industrial defense industrial base standpoint? Now you've talked about this, uh, but there's a there's a there's a whole other battlefield out there. I, I, th I think you might define it that the competition with China uh, around um, you know supplies of, of pharmaceuticals and, and you know now we find out that all of our all of our masks come from China. Um, mm -hmm. What uh, uh, and and of course China has made a big deal about uh, the Belt and Road Initiative and the Maritime Silk Road and sort of a, a stated objective of of dominating uh, shipbuilding, ship operations, and ports around the world so that they can dominate world trade. Um, uh, there's not a shot fired in that scenario. There's not a you know mm -hmm. there's not a uh, yeah. Talk a little bit about that if you if you if you wouldn't mind. <laughs> yeah, no, I, th I think it's a, certainly a challenge for the United States moving forward. There, there's been a growing recognition, I think, over the past few years that to some degree economic security is national security, as the national security strategy put it. And there's recognition that some of these competitions that are economic in nature and are mostly carried out by commercial actors, really not defense actors at all, are essential to our national security be they uh, competitions in terms of shipbuilding or commercial carriers, as China has been trying to focus on certain segments of the market to crowd out not only U.S. carriers, but also even foreign ones, such as European ones that the U.S. has relied on for a long time. Uh, there's also efforts in terms of the Belt and Road Initiative, it used to be known as One Belt, One Road, which I think is a little more indicative of the, the intentions of that strategy. Uh -huh. um, and that's, I think, overall trying to create this integrated um, maritime strategy that's in some respects more Mahanian than the U.S. maritime strategy that to date has been highly naval, mm -hmm. right? It's been very focused on 
the sea services of the Navy, the Marine Corps, the Coast Guard, and what are their contributions, but in general has ignored what are the broader contributions of the defense maritime industrial base. I think the challenges posed by China are now forcing us as a nation to have to consider more closely what's, what are the commercial contributions of our commercial actors compared to our military ones, and how can we work together? It doesn't mean that the U.S. is likely going to have to uh, challenge China's large subsidies and uh, uh, scrapping subsidies, uh, operating subsidies, construction subsidies in many areas. But there are probably some key areas where the U.S. needs to focus on, not for economic purposes, but really for national security ones, to be able to ensure that we retain that access in, in a global economic competition and then, if necessary, in a military one during a conflict. Yeah, and, and also what's going on here is a lot of this uh, long-term competition we're in with China is going to be involving you know, no shots fired, as you said. Right. So it's happening at the, below the level of war. And China has very much embraced this. They've di- they've They've internalized this and said, yes, we're going to win this fight by avoiding having armed conflict with the United States. We may have some gray zone altercations with the Philippines or Vietnam or others in our neighborhood, but we'll avoid having some kind of larger scale uh, work with the, with the United States. To do that, though, they need the, the target audience for their efforts is the neighbors around them. So their target audience is the Southeast Asian nations, uh, the uh, Indian Ocean littoral nations uh, in Africa, in uh, South Asia, and all the way over to Southeast Asia. They're looking to influence those countries to believe that China is the predominant maritime power in their regions as well as being you know, mm-hmm. the predominant power in the Western Pacific. Mm-hmm. Uh, and to part as, as part of doing that is get control of ports, um, convince countries to take their uh, subsidized infrastructure development, maybe with loans that then can allow them to get into a debt trap that the Chinese can then exploit. All of that is designed to create this sense on the part of these target nations that the United States is not their best ally, but that China is there, is their yeah. friend, and that they should turn to China when they need assistance or when they need advice on what to do in their region. Yep. I think the other attribute of this is that, as Brian mentioned, it's a long-term strategic competition. Right. So as a nation, there are probably some investments we can make in the near term and spend a lot of money to try to fix some of these gaps that we have in the force. But we really probably need to change the model from the current one that's pretty flawed in terms of our approach to sea lift and other parts of the maritime industry to a new one, sort of a new, more sustainable and, and lower cost model that works over the long run. Because if not, we probably won't have enough money to fix those gaps in the near term anyways, uh, and then certainly couldn't sustain that level of investment over decades of potential competition. That's interesting. And, and that is a good segue, I think, to the, uh, to the, I guess, my final point, and maybe this just echoes what you've been saying, but I love the, one of the first sentences in your, in your report. To, to effectively compete, the United States will need to break with maritime strategies that assume commercial and national security contributions of the maritime industry are largely distinct. Instead, the United States should adopt a new approach that recognizes the inherent linkage between the two and fosters a healthier commercial uh, industry that can support U.S. national security. I wish I'd said that. That's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, But we really felt strongly the analysis showed that the maritime industry is a, is different than the other industries that support national yeah. security that the U.S. government turns to for defense capabilities because it does really have to operate in parallel. And then periodically, we need to turn back to the commercial industry to support uh, what the U.S. needs from a national security And it's standpoint. interesting that you say that, that other other players, uh, the major players in the, in the Pentagon, commercial players in the Pentagon, are, are different. They're right. really not like that. That's, uh, yeah, because over time they become sort of a the the single or, or sole source or one of a couple of sources of vendors for particular platforms or materials, um, and there's really no commercial counterpart to them. Uh, but the maritime industry is different in that the U.S. depends entirely on uh, shipping capacity that comes from outside of the U.S. government, um, depends right. in large part for uh, ship repair on organizations that do work for the government as well as for commercial industry. So uh, there's there's some inter, inner relationships between the commercial industry and the government and the maritime that are different than what's in the place in other industries. Interesting. Let me let me offer you a chance to riff on any anything that you like to anything you'd like to 
add, as, especially as it relates to the domestic maritime industry? Uh, so one thing we thought was really important, we talked about the, the kind of homeland security and right. national security implications right. of having a U.S.-owned uh, domestic maritime or a d- domestic shipping industry. Uh, and we found that that actually turned out to be a really important factor because we look at the one belt, one road and what's happening overseas when China takes over a port and then t- maybe takes over some of the inland shipping companies that a country has, a smaller country. Um, that really puts China in the driver's seat in terms of policies that those shipping companies adopt, how they relate back to Chinese, uh, the Chinese parent company, uh, how much access you know China may afford those host nations when the time comes to have a disagreement. Um, so if you turn to the example of Sri Lanka and the Humambata right. uh, ship or the port facility, they really don't have any control now over that port facility and how it's used and who is allowed access and who's not allowed access. Um, all of those things could happen in the United States. You know, one belt, one road could come to the United States if we didn't have the requirement that uh, that uh, ships calling on U.S. ports had to be U.S. owned, U.S. crewed, um, and U.S. flagged. Um, and people will call that a, a subsidy or call that protectionist or call that um, you know a, a attempt to, to prop up an industry that's not economically viable. But I would offer that there's a rationale for it that's clearly supported by national security that we are now seeing um, proven out right. by looking at other countries and their experience with the Chinese with One Belt, One Road. The, the need for that th- that set of laws is, gr- is, right. is greater now than it was. You know, it's interesting because it's been 30 years uh, since the end of the Cold War, uh, almost. And, and uh, uh, you know, we've sort of gone through the period where uh, we could, you know, it was the end of history. We didn't have to worry about, right. uh, uh, you know, major rivals uh, on the international st- stage. And, and that's certainly changing. And it has ramifications for policies across the board, including the Jones Act and other uh, yeah. policies. You're talking a-, a lot. About. It's been 30 years since the end of the Cold War. It's it's 100 years since the enaction of the Jones Act, right? right. Um, but, but it's actually in 1789 was the, the first time where the, where the U.S. Congress took on this issue, right, where they passed a series of acts re- restricting navigation because they thought so they saw the threat posed by British shipping and some of the foreign shipping that was coming into the U.S. market, crowding out U.S. goods, U.S. carriers, U.S. shipbuilders. So it's an issue that I think has come up periodically throughout American history, be it the founding of our republic, the Civil War, uh, the early 1930s uh, or 1920s and 30s. Uh, and now we're having to face it again as a nation. And yeah. so th- the question will be, what are the right set of regulations and policies to move us forward into the future? So drawing on a strong, I think, basis that we have today, but thinking through what are the new policies to strengthen that defense maritime in- industrial base for the next 30, 100 years? Right. You know, and, and again, you know, the national security lens is what we use because we went into the study um, trying to take a skeptical look at whether things like the Jones Act um, or the Maritime Security Program or um, the uh, you know, the tanker, uh, mm-hmm. uh, the, the VITA, the, the vessel. The volunteer right. tanker. Right, right, right. right. Um, it, whether those things were required or not or whether they were sort of um, holdovers from a Cold War time when we, when we right. depended on that. And we found that they had very strong contributions to national security that if we didn't have them, we'd be worse off uh, because we would lose things like the mariners necessary for sea lift or we wouldn't have access to ships that would be able to carry materials overseas in a contingency right. Right. or we would have uh, Chinese-owned shipping companies operating in our domestic waterways and we'd have the experience that we see with One Belt, One Road. Uh, so we tried to be skeptical in evaluating the Jones Act and some of these other regulations, and we found that they were still necessary, um, but their purpose had changed over time. You know, the value of the Jones Act initially was seen as providing for this U.S. shipbuilding industry and somehow keeping it, and keeping it strong uh, and providing for a domestic fleet from an economic perspective more so than a national security perspective. Um, and now we've seen it kind of evolve to where we need these uh, mechanisms primarily to support national security, but they don't necessarily make a huge economic impact for the nation. That's great. Well, thank you very much for, uh, for, for being here today and, and uh, uh, for, for putting out the report and, and uh, explaining it very well. It's been, it's been a, a pleasure uh, uh, talking to you. Thank you for joining us today for the American Maritime Podcast. We hope you continue to tune in as we explore the impacts of the domestic maritime industry and the 650,000 men and women who make American maritime work. Like what you heard? Never miss an episode by subscribing to our podcast on iTunes and like us on Facebook and Twitter. Until next time, I'm Mike Roberts. Thank you for joining us at the American Maritime Podcast.